Grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Occasionally, it's, it's fun to look back and see how things have changed. It's, it's fun to talk to teenage kids about how things have changed, for example, in the course of my lifetime. Uh, in ninth grade, I took a very important class called typing. Typing. It was a half the year, and you learned to type on what was called an electric typewriter, which uh, a lot of our kids have never seen a typewriter. But you would insert a uh, piece of paper in that typewriter, as some of you might remember, and you had uh, another sheet. You were supposed to copy the same exact thing by the stroke of your fingers or something that was up on the blackboard. You were blackboard. You were supposed to uh, copy that down. If you made a mistake, you uh, simply had to turn that piece of paper into your teacher and they would see you made a mistake. It happens. Uh, But later on as the semester progressed, we were typing letters and papers and a variety of different things. And you were uh, given the opportunity to correct your mistakes. So you'd, uh, if you made a mistake, you'd have to take the paper out of the machine, you'd get this magic stuff called white out, which was pretty new to me at the time. You'd uh, paint over your mistake, and then you would have the difficult task of trying to get that dumb piece of paper back in. Because it was tough to line that thing up, and if you didn't line it up correctly, everything else was just out of whack, and it was very, very obvious. Uh, I finished that typing class in January 1984. I would say it's one of the most helpful classes I ever took. And almost, I think it was like a couple days later, there was uh, the 1984 Super Bowl. And a, a local team played in that event. I'm sorry to remind you, they got slaughtered. But during that, uh, during that Super Bowl, one of the most iconic commercials of all time appeared, which was... Uh, Apple unveiling their personal computer called the Macintosh. To this day, it ranks as one of the most memorable moments in all Super Bowl history. Uh, but I, you know, I, I know there are many, pers- many, many different pioneers in the personal computer revolution, but uh, Steve Jobs of Apple will always be remembered for his role in kind of bringing computers into the hands of everyday people. I remember that later that year, 1984, uh, one of my friends, his brother, was going away to Drexel University. It was one of the colleges. At that age, everyone had to have a computer. And I remember seeing the Macintosh for the first time. And I remember thinking to myself, this is the coolest typewriter I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, you could correct mistakes right there on the screen. You know, with the old typewriter I kind of grew up on, every single paper looked the exact same. But here on this... Macintosh, you could specify these things called fonts and change the look at every line if you felt like it. And it was just kind of revolutionary. We don't even think about that, but it's easy to change margins or as a, uh, I think, a thing I remember writing papers, you could subtly change the uh, spacing to, to make your, uh, you didn't have to write so much by changing the spacing. It was easy to underline. You could save your work and come back later. You didn't have to didn't have to rewrite a whole paper because of this cut and paste option. We we take that for granted. How much that has actually changed life. But the thing I remember too is this simple tool that they had called the bold button. After working on a paper, you could highlight a word or a phrase or a sentence, and with a click of one button, all of a sudden there was this thick dark letters that appeared on the screen that stood out from all the rest. It was a tool you used to emphasize something you wanted the others to see. It was to provide clarity, and it was your way of intentionally choosing, this is important. And as I think about that, I say, what in our life do we really highlight and emphasize as truly, truly important? Is it our faith, or is our faith too often just like the rest of the world? You know, I I think about those uh, two guys kneeling in the uh, screen today on that image, Peter and John. They were really ordinary people of that day. In fact, they were from the lower class, ordinary fishermen. 
But Jesus appeared in their life at the right time. They were in the right place. And Jesus simply said words they'll never forget. He said, follow me. He became their mentor. They became his apprentices. And their education was not book learning. Their education with Jesus was on the road, on the move. The world was the classroom laboratory. They witnessed and absorbed how Jesus interacted with other people. They saw his courage in the face of oppression. They saw him challenge people in authority. They saw him really as a disruptive force of goodness that challenged the status quo. And to the leaders of that day, the way, the, the, way the leaders of the day viewed Peter and John and most of the followers of Jesus and Jesus himself, they, they just viewed them as country bumpkins, uneducated simpletons who were really just a major nuisance that they wanted to get rid of. The leaders of the day wanted to hit that delete button on the Jesus movement. They thought they had gotten rid of Jesus. Now his followers were stirring up things, and they wanted to hit the delete button and get rid of them as well. They, what they t- did was, and what we've sort of seen as people have watched the series, and as you read the book of Acts, you see them trying to threaten intimidate, try to drain all ounce of courage from the followers. So if they didn't totally exterminate them, they could at least silence them, silence them from acting. Peter and John, you know, I I, I wanted to say they began to hit the bold button, but something else, someone else hit the bold button on their behalf. Because what they they did was somehow in the midst of this opposition, They kept pointing to Jesus is alive. This story, our life is about serving Jesus. His work continues. You can't silence it. The good works that you see us doing are not our own power. It's God's power working within us. And it's not going to stop is what they were saying. And they say, hey, if we can't stop it, why don't you join in? Join in this Jesus movement. You know, what we need to remember is that boldness... In scripture, you know, it means freedom in speaking. It means living without ambiguity. It means serving the Lord. It means fearless confidence. It means cheerful courage. And what I say, it means not getting derailed from living by faith or letting that faith be silenced. You know, what we see in the book of Acts, you know, we, we often spotlight people like Peter and John because of their courage in the earliest days of the movement, and sometimes I think we struggle to see our close connection to them. We elevate them as extra spiritual, or they saw Jesus face to face, and we somehow view them as better than us. But they were ordinary people like all of us are ordinary. They weren't bold by some quality they possessed or some extra special gift that that they had that no one else had. It says... They were filled with the Holy Spirit in the story today and what we'll see throughout Acts. It says at key moments they were filled with the Holy Spirit and what follows, what emerges from that filling is bold action and bold speech that inspires other people, that challenges the world around them, that opens hearts and minds and ultimately changes lives by their witness. Boldness is a gift that flows from God at the right time and in the right place. And it's not something we should ever take for granted. It's not just a gift that we can summon up at any moment in time. You know, I, I think it's, we need to view it as a renewable source of energy that's always available to us. But it's important that it be stirred up. It's important that it be stirred up. Because what God stirs, God refreshes and refuels and continues to help move forward in bold ways. You know, uh, when, when, when God stirs in our life, what happens is that God gives to us, guides us, directs us, leads us to do more than we think possible, over and over and over again. What, what you'll see tonight, what you, when the reading of Scripture in Acts 4, you realize they just simply can't keep Peter and John behind bars. They release them in the very next scene, in the very next verses of this story, and what happens is Peter and John go, to their, go right back to, to the community. They go back to this community of faith. They begin worship, and in that worship, what they pray together is, God, 
give us all a sense of boldness. Stir up in our hearts so that we can all be bold in our speech, in our action, in the world. Help us to do things we can't do on our own. And I uh, think that's a prayer all of us need to pray this day, is God, stir up in every last one of us, stir up that spirit so we can be bold in this community. And I, I think what you, all of us could say to ourselves, what do I need to be more bold? What do I need God's help to do, to do in the coming days? Perhaps that means you're asking God to get rid of anger. Perhaps there's someone in your life, there's a broken relationship that you need the courage to, uh, to go and bring reconciliation or offer forgiveness or say, I am sorry. Perhaps you uh, need to become more caring and intentional in reaching out to someone. Perhaps you're called to look out for someone or befriend someone, or perhaps you need God to uh, simply nudge you and say, that's a person you've been ignoring, now go to them. Perhaps you need to have the courage to speak out against an injustice that you've been hearing about, that you know is there, but you've been too, too long silent. Perhaps you, need, you know you have a gift and you just simply have not had the courage to share it and you need the Spirit to say, hey, you can do it, I'll be with you. And perhaps all of us could use a little nudge to tell another person about the love of God in the midst of our daily life. Finally, I think the one of the things I love in this story today is verse 13. Verse 13 is kind of powerful. It says, now when these leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John, and in a sense it says these ordinary people, they recognize them as companions of Jesus. You know, when I, when I, I don't know whether I'll have a tombstone at the end of my life or what, but I hope at the end of the life, maybe on my bulletin cover uh, for my memorial service, it simply reads, a companion of Jesus. In a sense, one who uh, relied on God, who wasn't perfect, who tried to change for the better, who trusted in the gift of the goodness of God, and was able to do a bit more because of the Spirit leading and guiding. It's a prayer for all of us as individuals, but as a community, I hope in all the years to come that the community around us looks at the people of Good Shepherd and says, yes, indeed, those are wonderful companions of Jesus who change the world around us by their love of the Lord and the Spirit guiding them to do way more than they can possibly do on their own. Amen.